if you go to the very first page, page 106, you see this agreement was entered on the 4th of June 2013. So what's happened is they've signed four days later. <coughs> They're using yep. the form Thank 10613, you. which they use also in the Arabic version. Go ahead. I, I understand that completely. I think we're at cross purposes. It must be my, my fault. The 10th of June uh, or the 4th of June uh, agreement, no doubt about that, all the dates. <coughs> I was asking about the undertaking. Is there a date for the undertaking? Only the date that appears in this <coughs> to the Arabic version. And do we know what that is? Yes, that's, that's page 112 related. related. So 112, 112 is, is not the undertaking, is it? 112 is the... 112 is the June agreement, isn't it? Um, well, I don't profess to know Arabic. My understanding had been... I thought that the uh, Arabic of the undertaking is 114. That's correct, my lady. Uh, uh, sorry, That's I'm correct. grateful. And in fact, if your leadership was referring possibly to Mr. Mr. Pensioni's second witness statement, yes. which you'll find in supplemental appeal bundle, at divider five, um, uh, the paper page is 130, my lord, my ladies. And he says, in relation to the undertaking, at the time of the undertaking, brackets, it was provided to me on the 2nd of October. Ah, 90, uh, 20, thank you very 30. much. So the 2nd of October was when he was given it. Correct, my lady. Thank you. And indeed, that's also recorded by the learned judge alone, Justice Jacobs, in his judgment. Yes. And I did not understand until... Uh, a few seconds ago that it was my learned friend's uh, 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 factual case um, that actually it was in June. And that's certainly contrary to everything. That yeah, I, I, th I think that Mr. Koppel and I were at cross purposes. I, I think Mr. Think Koppel it's... was mistaken and I stand <laughs> gratefully correct. By my Thank you, friend. Mr. Keeley. There's no change of case. It's yeah. my having forgotten that basic point. So um, the, uh, it records the page 113. Yeah. Um, an undertaking to pay 161 odd million Saudi <coughs> reals by the 31st of December 2013. And that's what we have termed the undertaking amount, which is approximately the same as US 43 million. Yeah. And um, as the learned judge below noted in paragraph 91 of his judgment, the amount here sought is additional to the uh, amounts in the claim in respect of the invoices, hence why... It's additional? It's additional. Ah. And you see that, my lady, in paragraph 91... Of I judgment. thought your case was that it was... So your case is not that the invoice amount is subsumed in the amount of the undertaking. The, it is additional to the invoiced amounts. The invoiced amounts come up to, I think, a total of look in my skeleton argument on the page where the invoices are numbered, that's the uh, glossary page, there are 10 invoices and they come up to approximately US 12 million Well we know that the third of the three main invoices was not delivered until the 17th of December and so that invoice, or the amount in that invoice, can't be subsumed in a 2nd of October document. Correct. Because the invoice doesn't exist at that point. The other two so-called summary invoices um, have a variety of smaller invoices attached to them. <coughs> and the first of those ranges over a period that I think completes in September. Uh, I haven't checked the second one. Um, but you say, do you, that this sum relates to services that are extraneous to the services that are the subject of that invoice. In other words, there's more services that have been completed. Right. right. And that's got to be the case, given the amount at stake. Well, no. Uh, it would, with respect, it would make a great deal more sense if the invoiced amounts were subsumed in the undertaking. The, the way the case was put and understood by the judge, judgment 91, um, which is that, as you say, your primary case is that this is, as well as the invoices, your alternative claim is that um, 
you, you're entitled to the undertaking if for some reason the invoices aren't payable. Judgment. Correct. Judgment, oh. paragraph 91. Yes, and that's the point that I was yeah. um, referring to um, in the judgment, where the judge says at 91... Um, Page 88. Yes. Um, is additional to the claim in respect of the specific invoices. Oh, well, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt my, my lady, my lord, um, but if your lordships could look, or if your lordship and my ladies could look at paragraph 95, Yes. Of the learned judge's judgment, page 89 or possibly page 91 or 2 of your electronic bundle, you'll see how it was argued below. Which paragraph? 95. Paragraph 95, my lord and my lady. Forgive me. Thank you. Well, that was my understanding, Mr. Keeley. That's, that's why I'm getting confused. That's, that's my understanding as well. And there is it. Um, well, to complete the picture in terms of the way the judge characterised it, a paragraph uh, 74 of the judgment, uh, page 85 in the bundle, 87 electronically, um, so this is the beginning of the section headed, the claim under the undertaking background. And it opens by saying the question which then arises is whether this conclusion, that's in respect of the invoiced amounts, is affected by the claim made pursuant to um, the undertake pursuant to the undertaking. The question also arises as to whether there is an additional claim that can be made pursuant to the undertaking, which is not time barred. So what is undoubtedly the case is that the undertaking comprehends matters that are not absorbed within the invoiced amounts. Insofar as those matters relate to work that was not performed, do you have no permission to appeal in relation to that? Well, there's no... We, we don't have permission, and your, your ladyship is jumping to the uh, ironing out the permission. There's no permission. We don't seek to renew permission. We couldn't seek to renew permission. <coughs> In, res in respect of a repudiatory breach. That's the short answer to that. So what we say in relation um, to the invoice, sorry, the undertaking, is that it set out an amount um, th that was agreed, was owing, and that was agreed, had to be paid by the 31st of December 2013. And there was default on that, we say, when at 11.59 on the 31st of December 2013, that payment was not made. And at that point, the cause of action accrued. But that money was already agreed to be due. Yes, it if was. If it was already agreed to be due, there was in existence a debt. Th there was a debt, but there was no default of payment on the debt, and it's the default that gives rise to the cause of action. No, it isn't. Debt is a debt is a debt, and it's payable when it arises. Well. That's, the default pos that's the default position in law. Once you perform the services, there is a debt. Um, here we've got an acknowledgement that there is a debt and a promise that that debt will be paid by a certain deadline. But that's not an extension of time for payment by you. It's a promise by the other side uh, which acknowledges that there is already a debt for which There's, you could sue them. There is a debt, my lady, when one borrows money from a bank. Um, there's a debt from the moment that the money is borrowed. Provision is made in that agreement for repayment. It is only upon non-repayment on that date, that there is a default giving rise to a cause of action. But, but loans, loan agreements are very separate from um, contracts for services. We all know what the position is. With a loan agreement, it's either repayable on demand or it's repayable on a fixed date. And the cause of action doesn't accrue until you ask for your money back. This is not a case of somebody asking for their money back. It's a case of somebody asking for payment for services rendered. And as you, I think, accept, um, the, the default position is that when you complete the services, 
you are entitled to payment. Now, if you've got a situation here with an undertaking to pay a debt, that says to me there's already a cause of action. Well, one doesn't need an undertaking to pay the debt. The debt arises upon completion of the services. Correct. That is the default position. Yeah. The parties need have said nothing, and that position would have arisen. Yeah. But the parties did say something. The parties said to CPA, you have until the 31st of December to pay this very large sum of money, and it is only upon not paying by that date that the cause of action arises. That but it's not you saying it. They're saying, we'll pay you by the 31st of December. You're not saying, we'll give you till the 31st of December to pay us. They're saying, we accept that we're indebted to you, and we'll pay you into the bank account by the 31st of December. Correct, my lady, and they only default of that if, after 11.59 on the 31st of December, they haven't done so. Right. That's what triggers the cause of action. Yes, right, we have a solution. I'm grateful. Can we look then at the claim form, which is in the core bundle, paper 98 to 100, electronic 100, 102, um, sealed on 27th of December, hence the, the, the time limit. The amount claimed is uh, 48 million pounds odd, you see that in, on the first page. And in the section headed brief detail, which runs for nine paragraphs over the page, we can see that the claim um, in respect of the work, um, the invoiced amounts is in paragraphs one down to three, and uh, it refers to the two summary invoices, which we have in the supplementary bundle mm. at page 154 and 165. So the first summary invoice covers one to eight in the list on my skeleton argument. And the second supplementary summary invoice covers nine and ten. Then, so that's one, two, and three. And then four says uh, further, and you see that is in respect of the undertaking amount, the 161 million Saudi reals by the 31st of December. Um, and then at paragraphs 5 and 7, the claim is uh, put uh, three ways um, as regards the invoiced amounts, namely debt, um, alternatively damages for breach of contract, and thirdly, claim and unjust enrichments. The second and third one have fallen by the side. And then we have the particulars of claim, paper, page 101, <coughs> electronic 103, usual uh, opening provision, the parties in paragraph 1 and 2. Um, paragraphs 3 to 4 plead the contract, which we saw uh, just then, which is termed rather confusingly the first agreement. Mm. And then it says in paragraph 5 what is called an extension to the first agreement which it then uh, glosses as the second agreement, but which below I characterised actually as an oral instruction under the first agreement. So that's what's being done. It's got to be a variation if it's anything, because the subject matter is entirely different. Well, the um, agreement itself that we've just looked at was in what might be termed the broadest terms and very vague. What it provided for is the, the parties coming together and saying, well, we'd like this done under the agreement, and we'd like that done under the agreement. And the way that I put it, and you can see it in the skeleton argument <coughs> for the judge below, um, which we have in the supplementary bundle under tab 2, starting at page 11. You'll see it, paragraph 4, subparagraphs, down to five, and in particular five, I characterise what the pleader has described as um, an extension or a second agreement, as an instruction. Um, but in any event, um, it refers to a total payment of 12 million um, for the non-asthma um, 
uh, services. And that's so we don't see anything relating to that in the claim form, do we? Well, that's the 10 invoices. They come to just a little bit over 12. Ah, oh, but they're claimed under the first agreement. Well, the... If you look at the claim form, the claim form says um, very clearly that the first agreement, which is the June agreement, gives rise to the right to claim the monies under the, under the various invoices. <coughs> well, the... the Paragraph 3 pleads the agreement itself, which it calls the first agreement. Um, and then paragraph 4 has got an express term, which we've just looked at. Yeah. And then paragraph 5 says, um, by way of an extension, we've got these... Um, we've got another agreement. Well, it's called an extension to the first agreement. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at paragraph 6, between June and December 2013, the claimant duly provided the services under the first and second agreement. Now, you can't provide services under two agreements unless there's a split. What's really being meant is it's the first agreement and the extension second agreement to that where the services are being provided. And then paragraph 7 says the invoices were as follows, 7.1 and 7.2, and... Um, they have this, the, the stakeholders' funds in paragraph 9. So that's the way it's been drafted. Yes. Yeah. You but might it, characterize very it sub The point I'm putting to you, Mr. Koppel, is that if you go back to the claim form, uh, the cl it's very clear from paragraphs 1 and 2 that the three lots of invoices relate to an agreement dated the 4th of June. They don't relate to any gloss on that agreement, any instruction under that agreement, or any agreement made orally in September. Well, maybe the reason for that <coughs> is because they are being provided under the first agreement. The first agreement doesn't specify the particular uh, services that you see set out in the 10 invoices. It simply provides for an arrangement whereby the respondent could ask the appellant to provide those particular services. For that... asthma and pulmonary health care, it says absolutely nothing about diabetes, uh, other types of healthcare provision. I've been through it with a tooth comb, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Koppel. This is an important point. Um, none of the services that were provided under those other invoices would have fallen under the June agreement were it not for this oral agreement in September. Well, um, if you look, my lady, at the invoice at page two on the supplementary bundle. One point seven million. There's one I think that's attached to the nine million that, that relates to asthma. So yes, that's the one on page one five seven. No, we, I have it in the um, supplementary bundles at page two. Oh well, there's a there's a copy behind two there is. nine. There is at page one five seven, and that's the only one I've found that relates to asthma, but the rest of them relate to. Uh, education expansion, um, healthcare market, rise of digital ecosystems, retail and merchant uh, retail and merchandising industry, diabetes, a cro chronic um, epidemic, and desalination. Yes, my, my lady, absolutely, and that's why in paragraph seven point two of the particulars of claim. It characterises them as non-asthma related services mm. that were provided, paragraph 6, under the first and second agreements. And there's nothing in the brief details of claim which is making the distinction between what the pleader in the particulars of claim has rather clumsily called the second agreement or an extension to the first agreement. There is one agreement and there are instructions provided under that one agreement and they result in the 10 services that were provided. One for asthma and pulmonary services. All the others are non-asthma related services. Um, just complete looking at the particulars of claim. Paragraph 9 we've already introduced. That's the um, condition of having funds from the stakeholders. 
um, and that's to meet the other condition precedent to the cause of action arising, we say. Paragraph 10 deals with the um, undertaking. Um, paragraph 11 reverts back to, it doesn't even have an and between them, first, second agreements, so-called, and alleges that none of the invoiced amounts has been paid. Over the page, paragraph 12 returns to the undertaking amount and alleges that in respect of it, there's been no payment. And then paragraph 13, there's the um, alternative case for unjust enrichment on the footing that the work covered in the invoiced amounts was outside any contract. And then you have the prayer setting out the various ways in which the claim is brought as debts. Um, both under the invoiced amount and in respect of the undertaking amount. And then alternatively, in relation to the invoiced amounts, you see this in two, quantum merit claim, unjust enrichment. Um, and then thirdly, as in a further alternative, a prayer three is damages for breach of contract. Um, now, the way that the application was made against the court below was as a strikeout, alternatively reverse summary judgment that proceeded on the footing that the facts alleged in the claim form and the particulars of claim were true. Um, and your uh, ladyships and lordship will see that, of course, um, the claim form and particulars were struck out. So can I just deal very quickly with the permission that was granted uh, by... Mr. Justice Jacobs. So, this right, is so we're, the we're leaving the particulars, as it were, in order to consider your next head. Yes. Thank you. I'm on. I'm up to number three out of six. Um, so the um, order um, itself um, is uh, core bundle tab six, um, printed page sixty-eight, electronic seventy. And there are two paragraphs, paragraphs eight and nine, that relate to permission to appeal. And um, can, um, can, before we embark upon this, can I just um, offload my um, thought that uh, there seems to be, um, I've, I've a number of times come across permission to appeal being granted by a trial judge in commercial cases. Um, this is not the first time, and it's probably not only the second time either, that subsequently there's been a disagreement about what permission was actually being granted. Um, it, it's the, the question of whether permission should be granted by a judge at first instance is not just a question of whether there's an arguable case or not, but what's being allowed and what isn't being allowed. And a great deal of ink has been spilt in this case, um, and it's not the only one, no. on deciding after the event what were actually being served up. Um, so that's not a complaint directed against uh, you if it's directed against anybody, but I just think one has to bear in mind in cases where permission is being granted by a trial judge well, um, that um, you've absolutely got to nail down what you're, um, what, what you're granting permission for or not. Now, it may be that this judge has done that, uh, but Mr Keeley will tell us that he has done it, um, but it's certainly taken a bit of a while. Yes, and uh, <coughs> it's taken also uh, four um, orders from or Justice Males, which we see in the core bundle starting at 131 and running down to 135. Yes. But the point which I foreshadowed at the outset is that we're not trying to, in a sense, unpick um, any part of paragraph seven, sorry, eight and nine of the right. order. Sorry, I'm now going to find my way to where, where you were, which is at um, uh, Electronic 70. Think. Thank you. Yes, Electronic yes. 70. Got it, thank you. Electronic 71, <coughs> paragraphs eight and nine. Yes. So, in a sense, paragraph eight is what you're getting. Paragraph 9 is what you're not getting. Yes. Um, and um, so we see in paragraph 8 we've got permission to appeal against paragraphs 3 to 7 of, of the order, i.e. the strikeout. But then that's qualified to be in relation to the strikeout um, of the claimant's claim on limitation grounds concerning unpaid amounts allegedly due in respect of work actually performed by the claim. So it's only in respect of um, unpaid amounts, and it's only those unpaid amounts in respect of work not actually done. 
and then okay. and actually done. Sorry, actually done. Actually performed, I think. And then it identifies two parts, whether invoiced as set out in paragraph seven, for the particulars claim, in other words, the ten invoiced amounts. And secondly, the amounts quote encompassed within the undertaking pleaded at paragraph ten thereof. That's the undertaking to pay the hundred and sixty one odd million Saudi reals by the thirty first of December. And then paragraph nine, as I say, sets out what permission is otherwise refused. Um, and so that's to make it, making it clear in respect of the claim not based um, on invoices for work actually done, and specifically identifying a claim in repudiatory breach. So, as I say, I don't seek to unpick that, and um, it's uh, you know the product of some correspondence that there has had to be for orders from Lord Justice Males. But um, Lord Justice Males makes the point we think abundantly clear in the last of those orders, which is in the core bundle, tab 20, paper 135, electronic 137. Paragraphs really one and two. So it's a refusal of permission in respect of future work not a refusal of permission either on the invoiced amounts or the undertaking amounts to the extent that they related to work already done. So I hope that irons that out. In so far as they were struck out on limitation grounds. Yes, and they were struck out on limitation grounds because of the judge's position in relation to when the matter arose. So it all, in a sense, makes it doesn't stop you from arguing that uh, the effect of the undertaking was to extend the cause of action to the 31st of December, for example. No, correct. Yeah. And that would, of course, be within time. Yeah. Um, so that's number three. I'm on to number four now. Um, and this, your ladyships and lordship will remember them propositions of law. And our basic proposition um, is that in a contract between party A and party B, in which A agrees to supply services to B, in return for which... Just a slow, B, slowly, sorry. sorry. Agrees to ply, supply services to B, in return for which B agrees to pay a, a fixed sum of money, or a calculable sum of money. A's cause of action against B for non-payment of that sum arises at the first moment of default of payment. And to pick up your ladyship's point, which I can <coughs> see being... Uh, uh, into that me, we say it's important not to confuse the debt that comes into existence with the date by which the debt must be paid. And it's the latter point, if it's defined, at which if payment has not been made, there is a default of payment. And it is the latter point at which A's cause of action arises for breach of contract and for debt. Um, I, I think my learned friend said he wasn't running a case of breach of contract, and that's in my learned friend's skeleton. It is, and for debt. And in a contract for services, if the time for payment is neither fixed by the contract nor left to be fixed in a manner agreed by the contract nor determined by a course of dealing between the parties then the time for payment hold on Yep. 
is when the supplier has substantially completed the work. And we would say, made the other party aware that the work is substantially complete, whether by telling the person the amount is due or otherwise. So in every case that credit is afforded, you say that the cause of action only arises on the expiry of the credit? Well, the, 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 that's not how we would put it. The well, the answer to that has to be yes on your analysis, Mr. Cockle. In every case in which a supplier of services agrees to afford 90 days, 60 days, whatever credit, to the other party to pay, they are stipulating that you only have to pay us at the end of a particular period. And therefore, if your analysis is right, that is when the cause of action arises. Correct. I would agree with that, my lady. Right. Um, that, that all has the virtue of clarity. And I know you're going to come to the, the law in a moment, but um, just tell us what's coming down the line. Um, what, what, what's the authority for this well, the, the authority is the one that um, everyone has referred to in all of the cases, which is the Coburn. Right. So you say you say that's what Coburn says. Yes. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> and just and I, and we'll get to all of those authorities in a moment. <clears throat> but we say that to suggest otherwise is going to have surprising and indeed unfortunate consequences. Because let's say the day after a service provider has finished the work, the service provider causes a claim form to be issued and served on the other party because there's a cause of action. And indeed, in a standard response pack that this court provides in a claim for a specified amount, the formal accompanying notes provide if you admit all of the claim, then you send the money, including the court fee, any interest and cost to the claimant at the address given for payment on the claim form within 14 days. In other words, if it be right that it arises at the moment the service has finished, even if the um, uh, person who's bought the service doesn't appreciate that, then a claim form can be issued the next day. But if I... Sorry, my lord. No, I understand has to test these things by, by putting forward um, possibly improbable um, scenarios, but um, that, that cuts both ways. Um, but in, in those circumstances, um, the recipient of this um, claim. Immediate, immediate claim form has got a defence, which is that it wasn't payable the day after the work was completed. I either had 30 days or 90 days or a reasonable time for payment. They've got a defence. Well, the defence, we say, defeats the claim, <coughs> unless it can be said that actually there's a term in there which provides that you have 90 or a reasonable period of time within which to pay. Well, I mean, any, any, anybody knows that um, it, it, it isn't reasonable to finish the work on Monday. Um, and and say this is payable on Tuesday unless that's in the circumstances reasonable but if it's a normal commercial contract it takes time for bills to be paid but, but my lord that involves importing into the contract a condition as to reasonable time within which to pay in the, absence, in the absence of a normal commercial contract having a, um, a payment by date yes well that's our point precisely lord is that um there is um, a reasonable time within which to pay, or if the parties have stipulated a time, or it's calculable, or there's a course of conduct, then it's at the conclusion of that um, that the cause of action can be brought and a demand that the non-paying party pay the costs, court fee and what have you. Right. Anyhow, your, your point is that, um, uh, that it's surprising, if you're wrong, 
because um, somebody could sue on the day following and, yeah. and, and, and the, the, the unfortunate recipient of the bill would be bound to rights. Okay. And precisely. And we say that where, as here, the parties have fixed the period within which, by which uh, payment must be made, it's only <coughs> if payment has not been made within that period, but there's a default of payment and the cause of action arises. And this, uh, my ladies and my lord, isn't some radical restatement of the law. It's entirely consistent with Coburn College, and we'll see that in a, in a moment. But before we get there, can we just look at the um, statutory framework within which uh, this would operate were this a contract within England. I appreciate it isn't a contract performing services within England. It's simply got a choice of law. But it's important to test how this would work in the majority of cases coming before uh, the court. And it's the Late Payment of Commercial Debts Interest Act, um, which I would like to turn to. It's in the bundle of authorities, tab 35, uh, <coughs> paper page, paper, paper and electronic page 500. Now just to Before we, um, we look at this, is this referred to in any of the cases? It's referred to in one of the cases. All right, well, time enough, That's the time enough for that. Part. Thank you. Page 500, and just to repeat, I take um, complete agreement with my learned friends that because of section 12, which is at page 511, um, there's nothing in the Act to suggest that it has an extraterritorial reach, and indeed, were it to do so, would obviously offend the comity of nations. But put that to one side. The principle at stake in the appeal applies as much to contracts within the grasp of this Act, i.e. contracts um, that do belong to this country naturally, as it does to those that are outside its clutches. So it's legitimate, we say, to see how the Act works and the moment from which Parliament regarded payment as being late, such as to give rise to a liability to interest. And just taking it from the beginning, um, page 500, got a long title. And if we jump to section 1616, subsection 2, page 514, we see that in the Act, any reference to an agreement or to contract terms, including a reference to both express and implied terms, including terms established by a course of dealing or by such use as binds the party. So it's as wide as could be. Then go back to section 1, page 500. Um, it says it's an implied term in a contract which is exercised that any qualifying debt created by the contract carries simple interest subject to in accordance with this part. Qualifying debt is defined in section 3.1. And we see that the first requirement is that there be a debt created by a contract to which the Act applies. The contracts to which the Act applies are set out in Section 2, subsections 1 to 3. And we see that it includes a contract for the carrying out of a service for a money consideration. There are some carve-outs in subsections 4 to 5, but they don't concern us. So, Pausing here, had there been a significant connection between the contract here and England, the debts in question in these proceedings would be qualifying debts within the meaning of the Act. The next section we look at is section 4, um, which deals with the period for which statutory interest runs. And we see that from subsection 1, it runs in relation to a qualifying debt in accordance with that section, section 4, unless section 5 applies. And section 5 is concerned with the situation where, by reason of the conduct of the supplier, the interests of justice require that some or all of the statutory interest be remitted for some or all of the period. And I don't need to say more about that exception. So we return to section 4. Subsection 2 provides that statutory interest starts to run on the day after, quote, the relevant day for the debt, 
at the prevailing rate under Section 6 at the end of the relevant day. Now, just to fill that in, the relevant order was made in 2002. It's num order number 1675. And it sets the rate at 8% above the official deal rate yeah. as at the 30th of June or the 31st of December in any year. Current deal rate is 3%. So the rate of statutory interest is a very significant 11%. So that's what the rate of interest is. And we go back to section 4, and subsection 2A contemplates one of two possible situations. In the first, there's an agreed payment day. In the second, there is no agreed payment day. The term agreed payment day is defined in subsection 2b as being the date agreed between the supplier and the purchaser for payment of the debt. And the subsection recognises that this is the day on which the debt arises, but that that day, that day, is not necessarily as the day is not necessarily the same as the date agreed between the parties for payment of the debt. That's what that is doing. So it's recognising there can be, may often be a mismatch. Say that again, please. But what it's recognising is that the day on which the debt arises is not necessarily the same as the day on which the parties have agreed that, that, that it should be paid. Correct. Yes. So the second of the uh, two possible situations is where there's no agreed payment date and the, quote, relevant day for the debt is the last day of the relevant 30-day uh, period. And the meaning of that, you see over that page, under subsection 2H, is it's the later of the day on which the obligation of the supplier to which the debt relates is formed, or the day on which the purchaser has notice of the amount of the debt the sum which the supplier claims is the amount of the debt, or if subsection 5A applies, but we don't need to deal with that, and it's a more complicated situation. So basically a 30-day period from completion of the service or notification that the service has been completed. So what it's doing is it's getting certainty throughout as to when the time starts to tick for the purposes of what is a very significant interest obligation. And but returning to the first of the two possible situations, in other words, where there is an agreed payment day, then it's that day, unless a different day um, is given by subsection 2D, E, or F. 2D um, is concerned with public authority contracts. It's not us. They get 30 days. 2E and F, and 2F, sorry, are concerned with where the purchaser is not a public authority. Um, and essentially, 2F disapplies 2E. You can forget that for the moment. And what it's saying is it's looking at a contractually uh, agreed provision that allows a party more than 60 days to make the payment. So if you had a very large, well, like ours, where you've got a very large invoice, if it's grossly unfair to the supplier that the parties have agreed 90 days, then the 90 days prevails over 2E. Now, 2E provides for a relevant 60-day period, and a 60-day period is defined over the page at 2I. It looks a bit like a 21 on my print, but it's 2I. And as with the 30-day period, the relevant 30-day period, the, um, what sets the clock ticking is the, the latest of three possibilities, the same as the other one. Pulling that all together, in most contracts for services that have a, contra sorry, a contractually agreed payment day, then unless it would be grossly unfair to the supplier, the relevant day for the debt is that contractually agreed payment day. <coughs> That's how it works. So your intention is 
is the paragraph four period for which statutory interest runs affects the what would otherwise be the time when a cause of action accrues? It helps us. It, it supports my uh, submission well, in is relation. It, well, which, 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 which is it? Is it that it changes the time when the cause of action accrues, or that it uh, that you're showing us this as for the interest of it in order to support your two two things? Well, partly the latter, namely, um, it means that there is a consistency between the well, date it, of. I, I, I need to know first. Are you saying that this statutory? Provision changes the situation that exists otherwise in law. No, it confirms my understanding of the law. Right, that's that's helpful to start with, and <coughs> the it confirms, not changes. And the weight of your submission really falls on uh, two and two a, subs two and two a. Out well, of, all of section. Out, within the context, scheme. within the context of section four, and the weight that you seek to put on the words the relevant day for the debt. Yes. So. Right. Not that. It um, has the consequence that in the majority of cases, the date on which the interest arises starts to arise is coincident with the day on which the amount under the um, invoice has to be paid, i.e. that the causes of action start both for interest and substantial, substantive amount on the same day. Yes. I, mean, I, I thought from normal experience one has a situation where you um, to put this against you. You have, you have an obligation to, to, to pay, but you're given time to pay. And if you don't do it within the time to pay, you start to incur interest. It's like paying your tax or paying the Paying a parking ticket, um, you know, you don't pay interest in those circumstances. You, you pay a penalty and interest in some of them. Um, so, what what room do, would, do, do, does this leave for the possibility that you have a grace period, which people get all the time? I mean, well, with, with with the tax position, there isn't a grace period. What happens is your liability normally falls and arises on the thirty first of January. You can pre-estimate what it will be and pay it before then. If you haven't paid it on the self-same day in which the assessment is made, i.e. the 31st of January. Well, don't allow me to as it were, muddy the waters in a sense, <laughs> but I mean, I'm just not understanding what this, you say it's helpful, but I'm not understanding what it does for the normal run of life where uh, people are given a certain period of time to, to pay a debt without it telling you <coughs> anything at all about when the debt is due. The answer is it, it, it doesn't. Um, all that this statute does is it prescribes a particular eye-watering amount of interest that arises on commercial debts. Uh, and to ameliorate the effect of that, uh, there are certain circumstances in which it's postponed for 30 or yeah. 60 days. That's all it does. Well, if it be right <coughs> um, that the cause of action performance of services arises the moment those services are completed. The effect could be that if a claim were brought after six years, let's say a few days after six years of the performance of the service, then the claim could be brought for the interest, which would be six years times 11%, um, more than eye-watering, um, for the interest but not for the substantive amount. And we say that's unlikely to have been intended by the legislature. legislature this is a legislative recognition, we say, of when Parliament thought the cause of action for um, amounts due under a contract fell to be um, capable of uh, a, an action upon a cause of action. Right. That's the way we put it. Your Lordship asked me, was there any case touching upon it? The yes. answer is yes. It's the Russell plant hire judgment, um, which Malone and Friends, sorry, it's tab 21 in the bundle of authorities. Yes. Um, and so this is, the, this is the one case on this? This is the one case that we've been able to find yes. in relation to it. And it's the case that Malone and Friends cite in their skeleton argument. 
Act this 21, page 355. Uh, yes, 355. <coughs> and my learned friends uh, say that it stands in the way um, of us in our reliance upon or seeking support from the uh, 1998 Act. Um, and they specifically refer to paragraph 69 in the judgment of uh, Lord Justice Jacob. But we say, in fact, Ruttle is concerned with something else. What happened in Ruttle, um, my ladies and my lord, is that Ruttle agreed to just hold, just provide... Hold on, hold on a second. I'm sorry. Charles. Yeah, we're just getting there. Um, 355. Thank you very much. And this is at 368 internally, I think. Correct. And just by way of background, <coughs> Ruttle agreed to provide cleaning and disinfectant services to the Secretary of State under a standard form contract which provided for different <coughs> rates according to whether what was being cleaned out was classical swine fever or uh, foot and mouth disease. Now obviously the latter has greater overhead for the service provider than the former. And um, <coughs> on preliminary issues hearing it was held that it was to be decided on the uh, swine fever rates which are lower than the FMD rates. And Ruttle then issued revised um, interest claim based on that and claimed interest under the 1998 Act. And if we look at the foot of the head note, page 355, we see that there were two issues for the court to decide. The first was whether Ruttle, through the original wrong invoices, had given effective notice under section 4, subsection 5, we were just looking at that provision. And those invoices, the court will see described at paragraphs 7 to 12 of the judgment. And then the second issue is, well, if an effective notice had been given under section 4, 5, should there be a remittance in the interests of justice? And you remember I touched briefly on that. That's the section 5 provision. Paragraph 18, we see the findings of the judge below that were challenged in the Court of Appeal. Five issues are identified, and those five issues are then used to populate the headings. <coughs> of the and it's the fourth issue, whether if the 1998 Act did not apply to the second lot of invoices and the revised invoice, whether Section 35A of the Senior Courts Act, another interest provision, did apply to those invoices. So this section, Section 4, is actually obiter because earlier on in the judgment, you see this paragraphs 43 and 56. The Lord Justice Jacob held that the 1998 Act did apply to those invoices. So it wasn't really necessary for the court to consider the um, 1981 Interest Act. And we see that stated at paragraph 63 where he says, because I've concluded that the whole question falls within the 98 Act, the application of the 1981 Act is essentially academic. Um, and 69 is in the same section, and it's concerned with the 1981 Act. And all that the uh, respondents rely on is the passage at the end of this section on issue 4, which, if I may say so, just states in, in fairly bland form what the position is, in particular the last sen se sorry, uh, sentence. Facts like when the money was asked for come into the exercise of discretion under the 1981 Act, not, open brackets, save where the contract so provides into when the cause of action um, arose. So that's all you get uh, from Ruttle. 
I would well, just, if I I'm may not say. Sure, I'm not sure one can leave it quite like that, Mr. Koppel. Um, because the 1981 Act and the significance of that is if, if you go back to paragraph 65, power to award interest under the 1981 Act arises from the date when the cause of action arises. Uh, and so that's different statutory language from the 1998 Act, which is giving a specific date, um, uh, which is known as the relevant date. Um, so uh, although it's obiter, um, what um, Lord Justice Jacob was dealing with was an argument based on what the judge has said at 68, it can only be a cause of action for unpaid money, so the sum in question has been claimed and not paid, which is pretty well the principle that you're putting to us. He gives no authority for that proposition. It seems neither Chitty nor Coburn and College were drawn to his attention. I think he was in er error. The cause of action for the work done ran from when it was done. It doesn't follow that interest should fo run from the same moment. So, um, isn't this authority against you? No, my lady. What we will see when we go through all of the authorities, save for Coburn, is that they are really just an application of the Coburn principle. And what you get every single time is the court analysing either the contract, if it's the contract that gives rise to the liability to pay, or statute, where it is the statute which gives liability to pay, and analysing them, and it's entirely correct that they do so, to find out what the objective intention of the parties was. In particular, was it the objective intention of the parties to create a condition precedent to the cause of action arising, or was it simply a mechanism which was supplied in the contract where there was already a cause <coughs> of action, but it's simply a mechanism for the administration of the contract. That is the exercise that we will see carried out in all of the raft of authorities that are cited in the respondent's skeleton. You get nothing from them further and beyond what's in Coburn and College. Okay. So that's um, that. Um, next, the authorities. I'm so sorry, my ladies and lordship, but my learned friends have referred to a whole number of them. My basic point is the one that I've made, and that yes. is that they don't actually advance matters beyond... Uh, well, there are two ways of doing this, obviously. One is um, if you deal with the authorities that interest you, um, and um, if, uh, if, if Mr Keeley wants to take us to other authorities, he can then res respond. Um, I mean, don't take your own course, but don't feel the need, unless it assists with your presentation, to um, go through them all at this stage. It's up to you. Well, I... I'm quite happy to deal with it that way, but I make my basic point, yes. and that is that they are really no more than an application. Sometimes, there's one particular point that does need to be dealt with, and that is there are some statements in some of the cases that there need to be, quote, clear words yes. in order to get you into um, the alternate provision. And we right. say, well, would you like, shall we uh, deal with the, at least the main authorities? Let's deal with the one that I'm really interested in, yeah. which is Coburn and College. Yes. Um, tab 8, page 131. Thank you. <coughs> um, I say this is the starting point, and I would also suggest that it's the end point. Um, there is nothing since then that has altered the proposition of law that it states. What we see on analysis in later cases are instances of its application in different settings, some in contract and some in statute. Now, in order to understand the proposition of law for which it uh, stands, um, one needs to understand the basic facts of the case. And it arose out of a solicitor's claim against a client for services rendered. Importantly, the contract retainer contained no provision stating the date by which the client had to pay amounts recorded on the bill of costs. That's important. The chronology was as follows, the essential chronology. On the 31st of May, 1889, the solicitor completed his work. On the 7th of June, that same year, a few days later, 
the defendant client left the jurisdiction. On the 12th of June, same year, the solicitor posted the signed bill of costs to the client. And on the 12th of June, 1896, the action was commenced. So there was nothing, as I say, in the retainer specifying when payment of the bill of costs was to be paid. And it was the solicitor's case that the liability to pay arose with the delivery of the bill. So that's on the 12th of June, 1889. Actually, uh, this is quite a wrong. Um, in fact, uh, the reason there was a limitation issue was because the letter reached the defendant in Australia in 1891, which is within six years of the date of the commencement of the action in June 1896. The work, however, had been completed in May 1889. And that's why um, the date of 1891, which my learned friend has omitted both from his skeleton and in his oral submission, is highly relevant. Well, um, liability arose when the court said when the solicitor completed his work and because there was nothing in the retainer deferring the time for payment the court held that the cause of action accrued on the 31st of May 1889 when the work was completed um, where do we see the court saying that it makes a difference that there's something in there's not something in the retainer well, that's because of the passage at the foot of page 705. Um, in the report. In the, sorry, uh, 134 in the bundle, I apologise. Yes. Thank you. So, the, the, the point is that this was all tied in with the section 19 of the Act, which is cited at the foot of page 702. You see it's a reference to the Limitation Act of 1623, and then a little bit further down, section 19 of um, chapter 16, the later statute, provides that if any person against whom there shall be any cause of action of debt grounded upon any lending or contract without speciality shall, sorry, be or shall at the time of any such cause of action um, sorry or cause of suit or action given or accrued, fallen or come beyond the seas then such person or persons who is or shall be entitled to any such suit or action shall be at liberty to bring the said action against such persons after their return from beyond the seas so what it does is it freezes the limitation period, contrary to what my learned friend uh, just uh, interjected to say. So the basic proposition, we say, comes out from the judgment of the Master of the Rolls, which starts <coughs> bundle page 134, uh, report page 705. Um, and he states at the beginning the appeal must fail. Well, do, you, do, you, do you want us to read some of the sidebar passage in particular? Because we've got um, not all to of the sidebar, um, that is Just my sidebarring. All of the uh, sidebarring on page 705, in particular, um, starting with the words, the question is when such in such a case as this um, the cause of action arises. Yes. <coughs> right. So, what he says there, um, right at the foot, is it in the case of a person who is not a solicitor, and we'll see in a moment why being a solicitor makes a difference in this case, in the person who in the case of a person who's not a solicitor, who does work for another person at his request in terms that he is to be paid for it, unless there is some special term of the agreement to the contrary, his right to payment 
arises as soon as the work is done, and thereupon he can at once bring his action. So no reasonable time he can shoot off the court if that's what he wants to do and bring his action. So the right to payment and the right to bring an action go hand in hand. And what we say is it all turns on what is meant by, quote, some special term of the agreement to the contrary. And we say, if the parties say nothing, then it is, as the master of the roles says, his right to payment arises as soon as work is done. Thereupon, he can at once bring his action. But if they say something as to when his right to payment arises, that's all that they have to do, then that is sufficient. And the question is, as a matter of objective intention, is that what the parties in any agreement, including this agreement, intend? Or is it intended, as my learned friends would have it, that as soon as my client finished its work, it could, in the words of Lord Escher, at once bring an action. Uh, before you go further with this, could you just help me as to whether we need to trouble with the fact that this was a Solicitors Act claim? And th does it make any difference to what you have set up as a proposition? I mean, it may make a difference, of course, to the decision in no. the case and the month that's allowed and so on and so forth, but this proposition appears to relate to the sort of case with which we're concerned. Correct. And then it's important to understand why it was in Coburn and College that the, um, the procedural bar, or how the procedural bar operated, and what was meant by the procedural bar. That procedural bar is Section 37 of the Solicitors Act 1843, which we have in the bundle. It's tab 31, page 484. It's an old-fashioned form of uh, drafting. But um, the first paragraph sets out the basic prohibition on a solicitor commencing or maintaining an action for recovery of fees until the expiration of one month after the delivery of the bill of fees. That's Are we in tab 32? Um, Solicitors Act 1843, are we in? Yeah, I'm in tab. Your, your ladyship is right, I apologise. No, no, I've got that, it's fine. 32, page 484. Well, we probably didn't need to go there to be told this. Um, it says what it says. Is that it? Yes, and then if you go to the last paragraph, same section, on the next page, you'll see that the one-month bar could be displaced where there was cause to believe that the party chargeable with the cost was about to quit England. So that doesn't give rise or resurrect the cause of action. It simply disapplies the one-month procedural bar imposed by the first paragraph. And that's what helps us when you look at the whole section to understand why this was characterised as a procedural bar. The cause of action was there, it was always there. The statute came along and said, despite that, you cannot for the first <coughs> month bring an action other than in the situation yes. right down the back. And um, as I say, a lot of friends say, well, um, the only way you can get within the words of the master of the roles at the foot of page 705, that is to say, some special term of the agreement to the contract, if there are, or if the contract clearly provides otherwise by what has been described as a special term. And I say that that actually is a gloss on what Lord Escher provides for. It, it, that gloss gets some support from some of the cases. But, but it doesn't get any you, support. You, you say it's a, a, a gloss. I mean, what, what Lord Escher said in 
them. April 1997 in the statute. Um, Alicia, 1997. Um, and it would be surprising, wouldn't it, if in the last 125 years somebody in this court hadn't said something helpful about what special terms of agreement to a contrary um, is to be taken to mean. So I, I wonder whether we're starting off from the right mindset in considering the cases, including cases by the Master of the Rolls and Odisha's successor, um, about what this means. What we say is simply take the words at their face value, ask yourself... Yes, but I say there's no, there's no warrant for saying that one has to take words in a judgment at, at, at their face value. One has to consider what this court, in particular, I appreciate you, you've got um, points to make about first instance decisions, um, but uh, insofar as they're part of the reasoning um, statements of this court about matters of this sort, bind us. So we're not, I mean, even if we were terribly impressed by your submission, it's not open to us to. <coughs> To, to say a different is it? Well, correct. Um, but what I would say is that really they're doing no more than um, restating the principle in their own words. Um, and the principle is, and nobody suggested that it has evolved or become right. more difficult to achieve than what Lord Escher said there. Everyone reverts, um, all of the judgments uh, revert to Coburn and College. Um, and so I say you're, the best, the safest course is to simply see what Lord Escher has said and then apply that um, to the particular contract involved. Can one I just the, One of the things before we leave Coburn and College, um, I appreciate that the, it was the, it, it, the, the difference turned on the statute. Um, but one of the things one sees in the, in the passage over the page from the one that you quoted on page 135 um, is Lord Isha is explaining that there may be circumstances, in this case dictated by statute, where um, the right of the solicitor to bring an action uh, for the debt is divergent from his right to payment for the debt. And so what one is concerned with is when the right to payment arises, not the right, uh, not when the right to enforce that right to payment arises, uh, and so the special term of the agreement um, it may not necessarily consist of um, a, a clause in the contract which postpones the right to payment. Well, yes, I, I, I quite accept that what they were concerned with and what was supposed throughout because there was nothing uh, and there is nothing in the report to suggest that the um, uh, entitlement to payment um, arose on the 31st of May 1889 when the solicitor completed his work. Mm. That's, that's the point that's being made. So at that point the cause of action arose and the solicitor act simply stood in the way yeah. of that solicitor bringing that action upon a cause of action for the period of a month. Yes. So can I just touch very briefly on the other authorities without going into the detail of them? Because I say that each of them turns upon a statute. That, these are the principal ones referred to by my learned friends. The first, and I'm going to take them in chronological order, the first is the Central Electricity Board in Halifax which is tab 7, starting at page 108, House of Lords Judgment. And it all depend, turns on a nationalisation of the electricity undertakings, many of which were run by local authorities. And then they got moved to the Central Electricity Board. And what happened is the Halifax Corporation, which had wearing its hat as the electricity undertaking, large, what then was a very large sum of money in the bank account for the undertaking on the day before the vesting date, when everything moved off to the a nationalised board, moved all of that money to its general rate account. So thank you very much, and left 
um, the uh, Central Electricity Board without any of that money. What happened is the, the Central Electricity Board said, well, actually, that money belongs to us. And they were right about that. Uh, but the problem was that they did not bring their claim until more than six years after that had been done. And so it, it all turned on the meaning of various provisions of the um, Electricity Act 1947 and the vesting day and what that vested in. And there was a long argument about whether the monies due under the 1947 Act were a specialty, in which case it would be 12 years, and that was found against the CEB. It was six years, and then the question arose whether the six years arose or started to tick from the date of a minister's decision as opposed from the date from which the money ought to have been vested on the vesting day with the CEB. And what we say is this doesn't help one jot in the determination of when the cause of action arose in a contract between two very different parties in a very different place for a service. Right, that's, that's central electricity. That's central electricity. It's tab uh, 7, starting at page 108. Right. The next, uh, taking it in order, is the Swansea City Council case. How many, how, many, how, many cases are in, how many cases are in your list? I mean, it's not my it's, list. No, 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 no. I mean, but I've, I've said, as it were, if, if we're going to go to all of these in order to be, be told that they don't help, um, well, I, I can, then I think we can probably start with a list and um, well, the, the ones I, that you think... Shall might. I tell your Lordship what the list is? And yes. I've, I've taken them out of my learned friend's skeleton. Swansea. The Swansea, tab 24, page 403, Court of Appeal. Thank you. Um, judgment. It's yeah. a Housing Act case. So it's a statute again, section 10.3 of the Housing Act, 1957. Yes. doesn't help one jot. The next one is Bryson McCormack, tab 3, 2004 High Court Judgment. It yes. was a contract case, but it was a construction contract, and all involved site establishment costs. As an analysis of the contract, it doesn't help, we say, um, one bit. Different contract, different place, different parties. Thank you. The next one is Henry Boot, Court of Appeal Judgment, Tab 11, 2005. It's a standard form engineering contract of the Institution of Chartered Engineers. The relevant clause was Section 60. That clause alone was five times as long as the whole contract here. It doesn't help one jot in understanding it. It's simply an application of Coburn and College to a particular uh, contract. Notably, the Court of Appeal found that it was a special term there, Section 60. That's a certification uh, provision in a standard engineering or building contract, which you see all the time. The next authority is the Legal Services Commission, Henthorn, <coughs> um, which is at tab 16, 2012. Henthorn. Hen Legal Services Commission and Henthorn. Now, this is the. This place. is one of the ones where. Um, it said there's got to be clear words if the default yes. rule is to be displaced. Um, again, it turns on the words in an enactment. In this case, Section 100 of the Civil Legal Aid General Regulations of 1989. Um, <clears throat> the limitation period here is not a contract one, it's a statute one, so it's Section 9 of the Limitation Act. And it's Tab not 16. a case about the date on which a cause of action accrues for services performed. It's a case about the date on which a cause of action accrues for a recoupment under Regulation 100. Um. Although that is a form of debt. Yes, and so the question becomes, at what point does it arise? And you'll see, in fact, um, that the argument which was made by both the Barrister, the Bar Council and the Law Society was along the same lines as the respondent takes in this case, namely the cause of action accrued when the work covered by the certificate was completed and that Regulation 100 
um, was just a condition precedent before a demand for repayment could be made. And you'll see that um, in the relevant passage of Lord Newberger, which runs from 20, paragraphs 24 to 56. And, and the argument itself is set out of paragraph 26. The court rejected that contention and held that the cause of action only accrued once there had been an assessment. And that had been the, um, the Legal Aid Commission's fallback position. Their primary position being that the cause of action arose once a demand to repay had been made following the assessment. And it's in this context that Lord Newberger um, said what is quoted in my learned friend Skeleton at paragraphs 31 to 33. So it's not simply the date on which the work is completed which informs the date on which the cause of action accrues. So there's obviously months of difference between the two. The next authority cited by Malone and Friends is the ICE article. Sorry, can, we just, can we just I'm sorry. look at what's um, said at paragraph 31, page 254. I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm interested in this not only for what, it, what the Master of the Rules is saying, um, but for your in, implied, I know you wouldn't put it quite this way, um, suggestion that he had no business to be saying it. Um, surely there he's dealing with exactly the point that you've told us it all turned on, which is the existence or otherwise of special terms. Yes, but in a statutory context. This is one of these cases where it's not dependent on terms in a contract. It's all revolving around words in a statute. But that's not what he's saying. I understand. I mean, everybody's got to decide the cases in the context in which they happen to arise. But there's no, there's no hint in any of this that that's not a point of general application, is there? Because he goes on the following paragraph to descend to regulation 100... Sub 8. Sub 8. Yeah. And it says it all turns upon what's in that regulation. It all turns on a matter of statutory... Yes, but he's, he's, he's positioning himself by saying we need to find, if there's going to be a special term, we need to find that expressed in clear words. And then he goes on to apply that lens to the case in hand. Now, I, I, I don't want to delay you unduly about this, but it, well, one would have thought that um, the expression special terms in an agreement to the contrary is the sort of thing that is capable of being elucidated in order to carry out a particular construction exercise, uh, whether it's statutory or contractual. And so uh, I'm really just pressing you because this is the point at which the shoe pinches, as it seems to me, um, well, on your suggestion that nobody's got any business commenting on Coburn at all. Well, I, you I just get, get, ahead and, like get ahead and apply it. That's uh, the essence of your submission. Well, I, um, I wouldn't put it in those terms. Um, no, but that's what, that's what... I know you wouldn't, but that's what you've told us, in, in essence. Um, and so I do need, as it were, your help as to Certainly. why particularly coming as it does from a subsequent Master of the Rolls, Certainly. what is said in paragraph 31 isn't bang on point and binding. Well, um, it may not, it may, it, you, you may still win the appeal, but um, we, we at least need to know what the, um, <laughs> um, what, what, what the correct law is, because, I mean, you have two ways of approaching this case theoretically, if we leave the grounds of appeal aside. One is that the judge approached this on the basis of a wrong appreciation of the law, and the other is that he got the law perfectly right, but he came to some conclusion that wasn't open to him. But at the moment, we're on the first of these, seeing what there is in your submission that, in fact, the judge got the law wrong. Yes, so the, the question that falls to be answered 
by the Court of Appeal, Master of the Rolls and Legal Services Commission, is whether or at what time the cause of action for the recoupment arises. And he sets that out right at the beginning of this section. That's what the question is. When does time start to run? When does time start to run for the purposes of the cause of action? And what it is, um, to the extent that he's dealing with contractual matters, it is in a sense not to the point that has to be decided. He saw it as a matter of the construction of Regulation 100, some Regulation 8. And that's why there is 31 and then 32. 32 makes clear that this is the issue that we, the Court of Appeal, must decide. Namely, in the case of Regulation 100, subreg 8, I consider there is a perfectly simple interpretation of that regulation which pays proper regard to the words but does not have the disadvantage of the Commission having complete control over when time starts to run against it. And then he explains. And at 33, he makes the fundamental of the decisive point in the second sentence. The date of assessment will be the earliest date on which the balance will have been quantified. So that is not the date on which the work has been completed. It's the date of the assessment. Because what he is looking at is the cause of action for the recoupment. Of the debt. Of the debt. Now, there is no debt um, that has been quantified until there is an assessment under this statutory scheme. So you've got a difference between the date on which the debt becomes due and payable and the, de and the date on which the debt can be uh, enforced, which is uh, by the mechanism of a demand for payment. So it's on all fours with Coburn, really, except that it's in a statutory context. Well, the debt arises on ordinary principles when the work is carried out. And what 100 sub 8 does is imposes a scheme... And, and, and indeed the money is paid out on that basis. What 100 is concerned with is the recoupment of that money. That's what the cause of action is, and that's why it's section 9, not the contract provision <coughs> the limitation. Act. And that's all you can get out of this judgment, we say. It's, it's different. So you're not submitting then, Mr. Koppel, that, um, this, that, that the... Uh, language of the contract in this case um, is of the nature that is envisaged by the Master of the Rolls in 31 first sentence, where it's the, of the essence of the arrangement that a sum is not payable until demanded. So you're not saying that it's of the essence of the arrangement in this case, that the sum is not payable until 60 days after the demand, which is the invoice. Well, if by this case you mean the, the case before the Court of Appeal mm. in Hornford... No, I'm talking about this case. It's not your submission, therefore, that you say it is of the essence of the arrangement, that the sum is not payable until, in this case, 30 days or 60 days after the demand, which is the invoice. It is, we say, of the essence. That is, what that provision, that those two paragraphs in the contract which I've taken the Court are concerned with is... And, and it takes its meaning, or its meaning has sense by virtue of the amounts at stake, that there is a period of 90 days from the invoice within which the appellant cannot bring a claim on the amount on the invoice sum. It is of the essence right. that the um, respondent has that time within which to gather the funds and make the payment. And it is only at the end of the 90 days, assuming funds are available from the stakeholder, it is only at the end of the 90 days that there is a default by the respondent that the appellant can rely upon to bring a claim in debt, to bring an action on its debt. That is what we say the natural meaning of those words in this contract mean. Could we, before leaving this one, 
just take what we can from paragraphs 49 to 51, um, which, in which the Marcel Rolls deals with Coburn. So, yes, at 49, what he is saying is um, the argument that the right to recover on account of the regulations is, in a sense, governed by the same principle as Coburn, recognising that Coburn is a contract claim. And what he says is, he doesn't come over the page, that the reasoning and conclusion of Coburn assists in this case save that it provides some support for my view that the Commission cannot delay the time running against it by delaying service of a demand. And he makes the point in paragraph 51 that Coburn was concerned with a different point, namely a statutory provision which simply imposed a procedural step, that's section 37 that we've um, looked at, on bringing an action on the cause of action. And he makes the point that regulation 100 sub 8 is different. It's a self-contained regulatory scheme and creates a right to recover and the concomitant obligation to pay whatever the balance um, is found to be due. Thank you. And that's why I say it's another instance of an authority that really doesn't help in terms of, um, even in methodology, applying the um, Coburn and, and College. Right. The next one, my learned friends referred to, is the ICE Architect one, High Court decision of 2018, which is at tab 14, starting at page 222. And um, what we have here is a contract where the claimant ICE was to provide architectural services to what was abbreviated to EPIC with monthly invoices subject to a £50,000 50, pound, uh, annual limit. And you'll see the contract provision is stated at the foot of page 223. There was an adjudication. Um, money was paid, but the balance um, was outstanding, and the claim was brought um, over six years um, after the invoice, but less than six years after the invoice plus the 30 days that we see referred to at the page, uh, foot of um, page 223. The judge at first instance uh, found that the cause of action accrued from the doing of the work not from the date of the invoice, let alone the date of the invoice plus 30 days, and so it was um, statute bar. Um, we see paragraphs 19 and, sorry, 12 and 19, that the principle is not an issue. And it's just another case, we say, of a particular contract being <coughs> construed to see what the objective intention of the parties was. Um, and that's all that's being done in this uh, judgment. Um, what was important, and we can see this, page 229, at the end of paragraph 22, that the judge regarded as important that there was monthly invoicing as a means of keeping a running check on the financial outlay of design services. All of the, the whole contract informed the conclusion that was reached by the judge. Different contract from ours. So it doesn't really help, either in technique, let alone in outcome, um, with the uh, construction of this particular contract. There's one thing in here which pops up in a number of judgments, uh, but it's just as convenient to pick it up here, and that is the policy consideration which is considered by the judge at paragraph 24, where again this judge um, says that clear words are needed if the court is construe an agreement between the parties in such a way 
has to give the creditor control over the start of the limitation period and or to avoid the courts becoming engaged in determining satellite issues that deprive the limitation provision of their central purpose, namely certainty and the avoidance of stale claims. And that's a point which is raised in a number of authorities, but it's, it's crisply stated by the judge in paragraph 24. And it's right that I deal with it, both for this case and all the others. Um, and with respect to the judge um, and others who have adopted this policy basis for, in a sense, demanding particularly clear words, we say it doesn't bear analysis. And we say that for three reasons. First of all, in a contract for services, giving completion of the service as the date of the accrual of the cause of action does not necessarily bring certainty or avoid satellite litigation. And the reason is that it is by no means always easy to pinpoint when services under a contract are complete. And this court will be aware that over the last 70 or so years, the courts have shown a greater preparedness to find that the obligation to pay for a service arises upon substantial completion. And I make that point in my skeleton and refer to the two authorities. Which that's paragraph 20, some paragraph 3 of my skeleton. So it is perfectly possible to have litigation, involved litigation, over whether and at what point substantial completion was reached. Not only that... You'd get that, of course, if, they, if the um, person concerned served an invoice and said pay within 90 days. You'd still get that. Not, my lady, if in fact the moment at which the cause of action arises is, is the effluxion of the 90 days. Well, you know exactly when it is. Um, you, you'd still have an argument about whether or not there was any payment due because the work hadn't been completed. Well, that's a separate matter. Exactly. Um, that's a separate matter, matter whether the work has been completed. This is at what point um, the cause of action arises. And what I'm saying is if the point is the moment at which there is completion, substantial completion, that doesn't avoid satellite litigation. It simply redefines what the satellite litigation is about. Not only that, but that date, that date of substantial completion, may be well within the knowledge of the service provider, but not the party that is to make the payment. Think of easy examples. I ask, I ask someone to clean the blocked gutters of my house, and they say they'll come sometime in the next fortnight while I'm at work. Unless they're particularly messy, I have no idea when they carry out the work. Um, I'm not as tall as my gutters, and I don't like ladders, <laughs> so I don't know how to work that out. I'm at the mercy of the service provider. So it doesn't bring, in, uh, bring that certainty that is said to drive away uh, from relying on the date given in an invoice. Secondly, completion of the service as the date of the accrual of the cause of action doesn't prevent the service provider from being in a position to control the date of the limitation period. Because the service provider can control the start by holding off the last parts of the contract. So they clear out all of my gutters bar one. Right, OK. And the third, the third point? The third point is, I say, let's um, take a reality check um, on the commercial um, position here. What service provider, we say, having provided the service, and unpaid for that service is going to want to delay beyond six years being paid for the service. Now, it is correct that there will be instances where negotiations take place, try to resolve 
matters without recourse to litigation. There'll be instances such as the present where other avenues for recovered, recovery are followed first. One cannot think of any reason why a service provider would choose to delay submitting an invoice for a work done in order to push back the date six years thereafter within which to bring a claim. Right. So just on this last certainty point, we say that certainty actually is better secured by giving effect to the words in this particular case in the contract, and that is that the recipient of the services, the respondent, is in default of payment only to the extent there hasn't been payment by the end of the stipulated period. Um, the last authority, I just refer to it because it's got extensive references in my learned friend's skeleton, is Hurston Dunbar, tab 12, page 183. It's another bu a building contract case. And the amount there is not being sought under the contract itself. It's being sought under the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996, which provides a scheme for payment where the parties haven't provided anything. And the first issue that the court had to decide is, was there a contract? Um, under which the claimant carried out the work. The court concluded that there was no contract, and you see that at paragraph 82. So it wasn't necessary to consider the limitation point, and that's why the judge describes it as academic. And then he goes on to consider the 1996 Act and the scheme under the 1996 Act. So we say that doesn't help us here, it can't be transposed. So what we say is that what really matters is the principle stated in Coburn and College and the words of the contract itself. We say you get help from the Late Payment of Commercial Debts Act, which we say stands in recognition of the correctness of the principles um, as we have stated it. Last point, number six, quick one the respondent's notice. Um, the court has that in the core bundle, tab 3, <coughs> starting at page 13, paper 15, electronic. And I, we deal with this in our skeleton argument, paragraphs 29 to 33. Two points are made, A and B. As regards A, um, it misunderstands our case, and it's the point that I made right at the outset. What is referred or termed as the extension to the first agreement was in form and substance an instruction under the agreement alleged at paragraph 3 of the particulars of claim. The instruction was given orally, but it was an instruction under the agreement alleged at paragraph 3. And that's the way that we ran the case before Justice Jacobs. And you see that sorry, in the skeleton before him, supplementary bundle, <coughs> tab 2, page 13 paper, page 15 electronic, paragraph 4, subparagraphs 3 to 5. And it is referred to by the judge in passing at paragraph 102. So there is no, in a sense, separate, distinct oral agreement which is alleged or being or made a part of our case. And that deals with A, paragraph A in the respondent's notice. Although, of course, it's not the way it was pleaded. 
there's not a there's not a, a word in the pleading about an instruction. It's a gloss you've put on it orally in submission. But it can't be for me to criticise other people's pleadings, but making sense of what has been pleaded at paragraphs three down to eight inclusive, it is quite apparent that they are not two distinct, discrete, freestanding agreements which are being alleged in those paragraphs. They've been called an extension of the first agreement. They've been said that these services are provided under the first and second agreements indifferently. And one has to give a sensible reading to this. In, in, con in conjunction with the way in which it's put in the claim form itself. Yes, and in the claim form itself... It's all under the first agreement. Precisely. And that's my point. There is a first agreement. That is all that there is. There's no distinct freestanding oral agreement floating about. And the amounts claimed in paragraphs 1 to 3 of the claim form are the self-same amounts that are claimed under paragraph 6 and 7 of the particulars of claims said to be under the first and second agreements. In any event, paragraph 102 um, of the judgment below um, the judge says, well, I, I don't think it took, takes matters any further. And we say it, it just falls by the side. Paragraph B in the respondent's notice, we're back at page sorry, 15 paper, 17 electronic. Um, I confess I don't quite understand the point that's being made. It refers to paragraph 13 of the particulars of the claim, which was the alternative basis of the claim, namely quantum merit. By definition, a quantum merit claim is brought where work is done and benefits received outside of a contract, and the recipient is said to be unjustly enriched in the, the point, relief and restitution. The point B is, B is otios, because it's answering a claim that you're not bringing. He's tilting at a windmill, is the way that I would have put it. All right. So okay. we don't, on your view, need to um, trouble with, uh, with with B unless um, and unless there are questions. inspired us to do so. Unless there are questions from the bench, those are my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Cobble. Mr. Keegan. My lord, my ladies. Um, as I understand it, my little friend's case is very much based upon Coburn and College, um, which um, is perfectly suitable to me, um, if I might say so. Um, Coburn College is Pons and Origo in relation to this case. Um, it's been followed time after time and expanded upon slightly, but not in any revolutionary sense, uh, by court of courts of appeal and by high court judges. Uh, the principle is fairly clear. It's clear from the case itself, but uh, were it not to be clear from the case itself, it's encapsulated in a statement, a very short observation by Lord Justice Dyson in Henry Boot. And uh, you can take it from there, really. Uh, we're going to go to college and uh, Coburn College because um, there is so much in it which is actually relevant and helpful. Um, but if one wants to go and see what the proposition is, it's um, in Divider 11. It's in the judgment of Lord Justice Dyson, with which Sir Andrew, Vice Chancellor, and Lord Justice Thomas, as he then was, agreed. And it's at uh, page 163 of the paper, the version that I have of the authorities. <coughs> of general application and it is binding paragraph 20 an early authority in which Mr. Roger Taha relies is Coburn and College this establishes the proposition that where A does work for B at B's request on terms that A is entitled to be paid for it 
his right to be paid for it, i.e. his cause of action, arises as soon as the work is done, unless there is some special term of the agreement to the contrary. That is the principle of law that one extracts from Coburn College. And the reasoning, of course, is set out in the judgments of Lord Isha, Lord Justice Lopez, and Lord Justice Chitty. That is a general proposition in relation to services contracts. And what does it mean, unless there is some special term of the agreement to the contrary? It must be a term of which the meaning and effect is that the service provider's right to be paid for the services that the service provider has provided does not arise as soon as the work is done. It's as simple as that. Just because a service provider permits the recipient of the services 30 days, say, within which to pay for the services provided, is not a special term of which the effect is that the service provider does not have the right to be paid for the services performed until the expiration of 30 days. If one were to contemplate the possibility that one takes one's dog to the vet for treatment and the veterinary practice normally allows you 30 days from the date of invoice within which to pay. When you take your vet, your pet to the vet, and the vet treats your dog, and on the way out you receive an invoice, and it tells you you've got 30 days to pay, that doesn't mean to say that you don't have a legal obligation to pay as at the moment when your vet has been treated. You, successfully. you, you owe the money. You owe the money. There is a legal obligation to pay. There is a legal liability to pay. And the vet, for better or worse, has the legal right to be paid for the services that he or she or it has provided. What the vet has done, and you see it so often in invoices, it says, please pay within 30 days, and thereafter we might charge you 1% interest. Now, in building contracts or in builders' invoices, it's very common. My vet does it to me all the time. Uh, but um, uh, what that means is that the vet has essentially agreed that you can pay any time within the 30 days. It's really up to you. You can pay it. You can't, once you pay it, by the way, turn around and say, gosh, I wasn't obliged to pay you. Can I have my money back? Um, uh, because I'm only obliged to pay you in 15 days' time, because I've paid you on the 15th day. This was a mistake. I need the money back. Uh, I ring up the vet. And I say, can you please pay me back? I think the vet would tell you to take a long-running jump. Because what you have done is you've discharged your legal obligation to pay for the services provided. <coughs> the vet, for their part, has agreed that you have 30 days within which to pay. After which, if you haven't paid, he will be entitled to bring an action or proceedings against you. He's given you 30 days grace within which to pay, and he's agreed to forbear to sue you for that 30-day period. As in Coburn and College, there's a real distinction recognized by all legal practitioners of any consequence between the accrual of a cause of action, that is, the right to be paid for the services performed, and, on the other hand, the right to enforce the right to be paid for the services performed. And all that one is doing in a contract, and in this contract, it was described below by uh, me, actually, as a fairly anodyne provision, and indeed, I don't resile from that. This anodyne provision about in all it does is to give a period after invoice within which CPA can pay, after which, if payment has not been made, CCI can
can bring proceedings to enforce the existing and pre-existing right to be paid. It's, that is it. You don't say anything about stakeholders and funds. Well, in relation to stakeholders and funds, uh, that, my lord, is a condition uh, which applies not to the accrual of a cause of action, because the cause of action has already accrued when the services have been performed. The stakeholders' funds are only relevant to the enforcement of the cause of action. If the stakeholders' funds are not available, then by agreement between the parties, the existing cause of action cannot be enforced, but there are a number of relevant consequences, or rather uh, a number of relevant concomitants. Firstly, the service provider, in this case CCI, is perfectly entitled to bring proceedings for declaratory relief, declaratory relief that um, uh, services have been performed and that there is a debt. That's the first thing. Uh, 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 and indeed, my lord, my lord uh, you asked me, if one has a look at um, a case which is in Divider 22 of the authorities bundle. This type of question has been looked at, admittedly, from a different perspective in relation to a different uh, factual context. But by the House of Lords in Sevcon and Lucas, what your lordship sees here is that you have the Patents Act of 1949, which provided rights, this is under held at page 370, provided rights to an applicant for letters patent immediately after the publication of the complete specification, and that if the applicant was able to allege that a defendant had committed acts which constituted infringement of any claim of the complete specifications published, there was a cause of action from the date of those acts albeit that there were circumstances arising subsequently whereby the applicant might lose the cause of action. Accordingly, since in the circumstances the plaintiff's claim was brought six years after the cause of action arose or accrued, it was statute barred. And then if your lordship uh, and my ladies could please turn to page 375 at letter E, Between D and E. As an applicant whose complete specification has been published, he has the necessary foundation in the shape of the privileges and rights that he would have had if a patent for the invention, uh, invention had been sealed. On the date of that publication, to constitute the necessary monopoly and allegations of acts of infringement after that date would complete all that is required for a cause of action. If he were to institute proceedings for infringement before the patent for the invention was sealed, the procedural requirement of the proviso would not be satisfied, but a statement of claim could not be struck out as disclosing no cause of action, although it might be liable to be struck out as an abuse of the process of the court. So you can't strike it out on the basis of disclosing no cause of action. The appellants contend that the conclusion, which for the reasons which I have set out above appears to be the correct one, would lead to absurd, uh, would lead to results which would offend the policy of Parliament as manifest in the Limitation Act as a well. whole. <coughs> they submit that the exceptions, for example, for those under disability show that Parliament didn't intend time to run where a person was not in a position to pursue his claim. However, the true principle, as illustrated in the cases to which I have referred, is that time runs generally when a cause of action accrues, and that bars to enforcement of accrued causes of action, which are merely procedural, do not prevent the running of time unless they're covered by one of the exceptions provided in the Limitation Act itself. And uh, uh, if you go back in this, um, in this uh, report, this is, by the way, the speech of Lord Mackay. It's not as though um, the learned uh, Lord Chancellor, he may not have been Lord Chancellor at this time, it's not as though Lord Mackay did not know what the law was. If you turn to page 372. Open and college. 
he refers to Coburn and College and identified what a cause of action had been described by Nagisha, the master of the roles, which was every fact, this is at H, every fact that it would be which it would be necessary for the plaintiff to prove if traversed in order to support his right to the judgment of the court. Uh, and then the definition was agreed to by the other members of the Court of Appeal. Solicitor's cause of action for payment for work done arose as soon as the work was finished, although there was a statutory provision that he couldn't commence or maintain any action, etc., until the expiration. And then it, it, it references made to the Central Electricity Board. Uh, and um, if one wants to look at letter D, just as it were, en passant, looking at uh, uh, an argument, it is said, in rejecting the argument for the board that the cause of action accrued on the 18th of September, Lord Reed said, no new right or liability came into existence at <coughs> date. <coughs> Similarly, in our case, turning back to where I was before, <coughs> when the work is done, when the services have been performed, there is a right to payment for the services performed. That is the cause of action. Upon the expiration of 90 days after invoice, assuming an invoice is rendered, there is no new right or liability. What there is, is the ability to enforce the existing right, and therefore to execute, as it were, upon the liability which already exists. Well, you could put it another way, the invoice um, is the equivalent of a demand for payment of a debt which is already accrued. And so you're just postponing the time at which enforcement of that uh, accrued debt can take place. That's exactly right, my lady. And moreover, the demand in that case, in that instance, is not, unlike the case of, that Lord Newberger was looking at, of the essence no. of the agreement, where, for example, under guarantee it may be only be payable on demand or a loan may only be payable on demand, where Lord Newberger in Henthorne says, well, in those cases, the demand may be of the essence of the agreement between the parties. But in, in ordinary terms, uh, for example, the rendering of an invoice, which in a, form, in a sense is a form of demand, that is not of the essence of the agreement in our case. It's not of the essence, uh, 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 it's not the essence of agreements generally in cases where services are performed in ordinary commercial life. Mm. People may um, be inconvenienced or worried by the failure to, to send an invoice for, for work that they know they're going to have to pay for, um, services they're going to have to pay for at some stage, and one can envisage situations where there's inefficiencies or for some reason or other invoice isn't sent in a timely manner, and that's all part of um, life. Um, but the point of the Limitation Act is you don't have to suffer under that anxiety for more than six years. You don't, exactly. And uh, uh, this brings me to one point uh, in, in this case. Um, uh, it is said by the Court of Appeal in Coburn College, by Lord Newberger, by other judges, that an important consideration in construing these contracts, uh, terms such as um, that with which we're confronted in this case, is the undesirability that um, uh, 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 the service provider should have complete control over the start of the running of the limitation. They, can have, they have complete control over um, when they can enforce the, uh, the, the debt in the sense that if they don't serve their invoice, they can't enforce the debt. But that is right. But, but we're talking here about something different. Yeah. We're talking about something different, which is the exposure of the defendant to limitation periods, which could go on until they cheat. Um, for an, a large number of years. Now, my learned friend said, well, this is uh, just a moment ago, that um, where you have a service provider, it is um, uh, unlikely commercially that the service provider would delay rendering an invoice. That may or may not be the case. But this particular case exemplifies uh, one of the problems. One of the invoices, the last invoice of the 17th of December, 2000 has never been produced. It is alleged by CCI that it was sent. CCI cannot produce it. CPA cannot produce it. This is recorded by the judge 
in his judgment, in uh, the core bundle. Of course, we have to assume for present purposes that it was sent, because we're assuming that the case is as pleaded. Well, uh, one can, and I don't mind doing it, but this exemplifies um, exactly the circumstances in which there can be a dispute mm. as to limitation periods by reference to invoices. It's not as simple as my learned friend put it, which was to say, oh, well, it's unrealistic to suppose that people would delay sending invoices and would delay in starting the running of time for limitation purposes. But if one goes to paragraph 14 in the learned judge's judgment, divider 7, paper 73, electronic, I think, 75, In relation to asthma-related services, CCI alleged that it had submitted an invoice dated the 17th of December, etc. This was in the sum of $3 million. Then this invoice is apparently unavailable. Neither party was able to produce it for the purposes of the hearing. It was common ground, however, that this was or is the last invoice that was actually or allegedly sent by CCI to CPA. Now, if my learned friend is right, and if no one can find this invoice, well, CCI can... can send us now one in 2022, um, uh, uh, some nine years after the work was performed, and say, well, I've just started li the limitation period running now. Because well, a similar point occurred to me, Mr. Keeley, in relation to the so-called um, summary invoices, because each of the summary invoices has attached to it earlier invoices. Correct. So um, if 30 days were to run, let's suppose that the earlier invoices had actually been sent out and the 30 days were supposed to run, what do you do then? You, you, do, you, do you postpone limitation by putting them all together and saying, well, there's still a debt and we're going to roll it up into a fr fresh invoice and serve you with that in an extra 30 days? Well, that would be entirely within the power of my learned friend's client, mm. which is uncommercial. This is um, a, a, a point which is raised by my learned friend in an attack actually on the on, on the judgment of uh, Mrs. Justice Lambert in the case of ICE ICE, but actually, if one is going to um, uh, uh, attack anybody, uh, there should be attack an attack on Lord Justice Lopez and Lord Justice Chitty in um, Coburn and College because it is they who expressed the views that for the purposes of the limitation. It was highly undesirable and inappropriate that the start or the beginning of the running of time for limitation purposes should possibly be under the complete control of, in that case, the solicitor or any service provider. And it is that which generated the statement by Lord Newberger later in the Henthorne case, Legal Services which is that clear words are required before one construes a contract in that way. Mrs. Justice Lambert uh, 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 addressed that in her judgment, uh, and she said that clear words are required. And Mr. Uh, Justice Eyre, in the Hurston Dunbar case, said, well, um, whether one describes that formally as the requirement of clear words, or whether one simply applies the general principles of construction, which uh, effectively will um, uh, incline towards a commercial rather than an uncommercial result, unless clearly directed to the contrary, it doesn't matter. So whether there is a formal requirement of a special term, which there isn't, or a formal requirement of clear words, which in terms of formality there isn't, or it is a matter of proper construction of commercial contracts, um, it, it doesn't actually matter. What is, however, if I can use the word clear, what is clear is that unless a contract compels the conclusion that limitation, the start of, of uh, the, the, the beginning of the running of time for limitation purposes is within the complete control of the creditor, one should not come to that conclusion if an alternative and perfectly commercial and proper result 
is properly and appropriately obeyed. Well, the clear words formula is said in the context of a position where there is a, a general rule. It, 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 we're not faced with a situation here where there are two possible constructions. Um, and in those circumstances, one can see why adding in things like clear words for preferring one over another might be difficult. Um, but in a case where there is a rule, um, then supposition that it's going to need clear words in the contract for the rule not to apply because everybody knows the rule. Exactly so. Um, That's the norm. It, so it's, it's, it's not in a sense doing very much more than saying that if you're going to depart from a norm, um, you need to say so. Exactly. Yes, sir. Well, is, is that a convenient moment? For seeing yes. C can I just before, yeah. one second, your lordship and my ladies have heard um, how uh, Lord, Justice Di Lord Justice Dyson um, uh, uh, described the proposition of law that arises out of Coburn and College and what it stands for. And if I could just turn uh, your lordship and my ladies to paragraph 16 of my learned friend Skeleton, which is divider four of the core bundle, at paragraph 16, page 31, paper, page 33, electronic. Sixteen subparagraph two. My learned friend sets out per contra Lord Justice Dyson, <coughs> what he describes as the full principle established by Coburn and College, uh, and um, he says known to students of English law. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's actually right, because I would have thought students of English law would actually look at Lord Justice Dyson uh, for what the principle is, because Lord Justice Dyson and the Court of Appeal have said so. But he says that if an agreement for services does not include a term specifying the date for payment of those services, the date for payment arises, and hence the cause of action accrues, upon the completion of the work, regardless of the date on which an invoice for those works is submitted. If an agreement does include a term specifying the date for payment of those services, the date for payment arises, and hence the cause of action accrues on the date specified, whether an actual date or determinable date. Well, that is not the principle established by Coburn and College. That, that is, with the greatest respect, a heresy. Known to students of English law, however. Right. Um, how long more have you got? Um, I want to go into Co Coburn and College. I know you've read it all. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't, don't say that for any other reason than um, certainty, which we're all <laughs> very anxious well, to start, achieve. Start of the running of the limitation period will be two o'clock, so I'll be an hour. All right, two o'clock. Thank you very much.